This past Sunday, we celebrated the transfiguration of our Lord. This was the one-year lectionary used the, um, the Matthew chapter 17 text to, uh, to read about this. And the other gospel accounts also record the transfiguration, but the one-year uses Matthew 17. And this is kind of a weird sort of festival holiday for me. It's um, thinking about, like, why exactly is it that we, that we celebrate this and we kind of group this in with these other high holy days? You have, like, Christmas and, and, and Good Friday and Easter. And in each of these cases, God is doing something that, that dramatically changes the situation. So Christmas, Jesus is born, and obviously that has implications. Uh, the, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Good Friday, the death of Christ on the, the cross for sins. This is a payment of sins. Easter, uh, conquering over death itself. So these are kind of before and after the events, things change dramatically. But in the case of the transfiguration, it's strange because it doesn't really look like that much has, has, has changed. So what is the deal with the transfiguration? Why do we celebrate it that, you know, God glows in the dark? Let's get into it. Let's read the Transfiguration account from Matthew chapter 17, just so you can kind of see what I'm saying. Think about what happened, what the state of things was before this, and what the state of things was after this, and how much they changed, if at all, really. So Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through, let's do 9. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Okay, so kind of a before and after thing. I mean, again, you know, before and after the crucifixion, before and after the resurrection, before and after... Pentecost, for example, th things things change. But in this case, it actually, it even ends with Jesus basically saying, don't talk about this. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So not only is it hard to see what actually happened here, what changed here, but Jesus is specifically saying, you know what happened? Kind of keep it quiet. Keep it to yourselves for now uh, uh, until later. So going over this, that was one of my primary, like, you know, some things in the Bible make more sense to me than others. Some things are like really apparent and other things you actually have to dig into them a little bit to be like, oh, what's going on here? One of the other things that I don't know if it perplexed me, but it, it kind of got me thinking a lot here is is the the place of the transfiguration. Now, I had this professor in seminary who was uh, who was constantly antagonizing students in, in a way that would make them think it's a good thing. Um, but he but he would say the transfiguration account is, is is out of place. The transfiguration account should have happened after the resurrection, after Jesus, you know, the glory of God was unveiled to everyone. And you know, thinking about it, you think, okay, well, like, that would kind of make sense if I was writing the story, and I'm not writing the story, but if I was writing the story, there are different places that I would put this transfiguration account. This whole unveiling of the glory of God thing, I would expect that to be after the resurrection, because again, Jesus is very limited in his in his presentation of divinity up until the resurrection. After the resurrection, he walks through doors and in locked rooms and you know, and, and does all these other things. But before the resurrection, um, Jesus is very limited. He limits himself. He veils his divinity. I don't want to say that, you know, he's any less God before the resurrection than after, but it's it's hidden. And he has certain things that he does. He has miracles where he overcomes death and sickness and all these other things. Uh, multiplication of, of, of bread and fish, for example, walking on water. And where he does these things that kind of it kind of hint at his divinity, but but by and large, it's not when people look at him, they see a dude. Is this the guy? Is this the son of the carpenter? Is this the guy from Nazareth? Um and, and, and this is kind of what you see before the resurrection. So at this point, when Jesus is on the mountain of the transfiguration and he is transfigured, so you think figure is like, like your form, like your visage, your, your, your appearance, his, his, his appearance is, is changed. Trans means from one to the other. So his appearance is, is changed and his face shines like the sun and his clothes are as, as white as light or as white as lightning, depending on, uh, depending on what you're reading. 
And he has this thing where he is visibly God. Now, uh, things that he does indicate that he's God, but at this point, people look at him and they say, wow, this, this glow-in-the-dark dude, this is God. And then, of course, this, for, this, uh, this reminds us about Moses on the mountain talking to God face-to-face, and, and, and he comes down from the mountain reflecting the glory of God so much so that he ends up wearing a veil. Uh, Moses wears a veil um, because of how much he is shining just by pe- being in the presence of God. Now, I fully expect that if the disciples had sat on the mountain as long as Moses had with God, then they would have been shining in that, in that same way. So, so in this case, you, you think, okay, well, you know, this, this, this God showing who he is, um, one place I would put it is, you know, uh, after the resurrection at some point, uh, another place I might put it is, uh, the ascension. So this is, you know, resurrection happened. Jesus is going to ascend up into heaven. Uh, and at that point I would say, you know, and then and Jesus is transformed before the, the disciples, uh, and, and ascends into heaven and he's, and he's glowing and, and his clothes are like light and, and all of these other things. I mean, again, that's where I would put it. So it's kind of confusing that this is, that this is here. The other place that I might put it is at the baptism. Now, there's a parallel here to the baptism is, is God the Father speaking out of the cloud? You know, this is my son, listen to him. Um, so again, that would make perfect sense if I was writing the story. Uh, that would be the point where Jesus would, you know, shine like like the sun and like light and, you know, all, all these other things. So you can see my, 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 my confusion, uh, my, my human, my fallible human brain, my limited human mental capacity as I struggle with a couple of things here. I mean, um, the, you know, what, what is being accomplished in the transfiguration? And second, why is it, why is it here? Now, the questions, asking questions about God, like why did God do this versus this? Sometimes God answers those, and sometimes it's like, you know what? He didn't tell you, and probably for a good reason. Like, you'll find out when you're in heaven, you can ask him. But in these cases, um, this has actually been a blessing, because these kind of almost confusing aspects here force me to stop and slow down. You know, there's other passages in the Bible that you can breeze right past because they make just so much sense. that You don't really dwell on them. But in something like this, you really have to dig into the text and say, what exactly is happening here? Now, my conclusion, what I think is happening here is this is not that, um, so the transfiguration, the figure of Jesus is, is, is changed, and then it changes back. This is not Jesus accom- or accomplishing some new level of divinity. This is not him accomplishing something like the forgiveness of sins. This is not anything like that. This is not Jesus physically accomplishing um, anything new, but this is Jesus revealing something. This is Jesus teaching. Now, if you look at some other miracles that Jesus does, he often accompanies these miracles with, with teachings and with parables and things like this. So this isn't out of place to say, look, what Jesus is doing here in the Transfiguration is didactic. It is not that he's accomplishing a specific divine command, but he is, he is revealing something to the disciples. Uh, he is what, And what is he showing them? He's showing them that he is God. I mean, uh, other people did miracles, right? There are, you know, the prophets and, and later on the apostles. You know, people would do miracles, and this would show that uh, their authority came from God, that God was, you know, backing up their claims. But in this case, Jesus isn't just doing a miracle, but he is demonstrating miraculously who he actually is. So later on, after the resurrection, this is why he says, don't tell anybody about this until after the resurrection. He doesn't want to confuse them, I assume. Um, is, is, is he saying, look, I am God. This is what Jesus is, is saying. Look, behold for yourself that this is not just me as a prophet doing miracles, but this is God himself who, who, who is standing in front of you. Now, the interesting thing, uh, and I, I was listening, I think it was Issues Etc. or somebody like that, was um, they brought up this, that, that this is not the only time that Jesus is transfigured, that Jesus is transfigured on top of a mountain. Uh, and and I was thinking, okay, well, in, in this case, Jesus shows how high he is, how high above mankind he is, that God himself would, would deign to dwell with, with man. So this is what Jesus is showing with his, uh, with his display of his divinity. Where, is, where are my notes? My sermon is very well organized. But there's another case where Jesus is transfigured. So Jesus is showing that he's higher than mankind, higher than the dignity of mankind, yet he chooses to interact as, as, as human. But he's also transfigured at another time later on, at the crucifixion account. Now, we think about the crucifixion account, Jesus paying for the, for the sins of mankind with his suffering and death, but there's an important aspect of the crucifixion account. This is talked about in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 52, um, well, 52, 53, Psalm 22. You know, there's, the, the Old Testament talks about the crucifixion surprisingly a lot, considering how many thousands of years were between the two events. But um, 
But yeah, so uh, Isaiah 52, verses 13 and 14, uh, think about the transfiguration, the changing of the figure of Christ in this sense. Not that he shows his divinity and glowing and shining and being, you know, a glow in the dark, but in the opposite direction. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, mm, on a cross, uh, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So in this moment of the transfiguration, Jesus is appearing as no human being has ever appeared. His face shining like the sun, clothes as white as lightning, whatever. But at the same time, later on, he is transfigured on the cross. He's brought even lower than humanity. So here he's demonstrating he's higher than humanity. Later on, he's brought lower than humanity by, by, being, by being beaten and mutilated to such a point where he's not, even, he's not even recognizable as a human being. He's recognizable as something beneath human being, ground beef or whatever, you know, a slaughtered animal. This is beneath the dignity of humanity. And again, at the same time, remember, this God is the God who glows in the dark. And this God who glows in the dark walked among humans as, as another man, fully God and fully man. And this God who glows in the dark and walked among humans as man died on the cross in such a state that he was not even recognizable as a human being. He was beaten and, and, and tortured so much. So again, if you want to think about this as a kind of didactic moment, is, is Jesus is teaching them. He's saying, look at what God is doing. God came down from heaven to be this. I am still that God. And this God is going to go forward and be transfigured again as the sacrifice for mankind. It's a beautiful kind of foreshadowing of, of the crucifixion. And again, so he tells them not to talk about this to anybody until after the, after the resurrection. Um, and, and this makes sense in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense, this also kind of fixes the problem of why is the transfiguration here? Because he's, he's, he's preparing them for the crucifixion and reminding them of who it is that's going to be, that's going to be put on the cross for their sins. And it's interesting. I, I, the, one of the things I was thinking about is, is, is Moses and this veil that he puts on. So Moses in the Old Testament stands in front of God and he starts glowing. He starts reflecting the glory of God. And he does this in such a, in such a way that he needs to be veiled in front of other people. And in, in, in a similar way, Jesus, when he's walking around, is fully divine, is fully glow in the dark. God glows in the dark, but he's veiled his, he, he's veiled his divinity in human flesh, in real true human flesh. So he pulls aside the veil for a moment and says, look, this is, who, this is who's going to die for your sin. And he puts the veil back. And then the final picture of the veil, I think, I think I see at the crucifixion ev event itself. Again, the transfiguration of Christ. But in... in in this case, the veil is the, the temple curtain, that which divides the divine from human, the divine from the mortal, is not just pulled aside for a moment like the transfiguration. It's not just placed on Moses uh, as a temporary solution to a, to a fading glory that's reflecting from his face, but the temple of the curtain, the veil of the curtain for the Holy of Holies, that which separates humanity from divinity is destroyed forever. It's torn down and torn in half. It's completely demolished, and this is why you can approach, you know, you can approach the altar without getting smote, and you can talk to God, and you can pray to God, our Father who art in heaven. You can approach God directly. This, this, this thing that separated the two of you that may have been for your own good. Again, the veil protected people from the glowing of Moses, and the veil at the temple protected people from getting smote from going into the Holy of Holies. And God has made it so you are now safe to approach this glow-in-the-dark God. So you are safe to approach God yourself directly, so there's no longer a need for a veil. It also ultimately points forward to, you know, what's going to be going on in heaven. You're going to be in the unveiled glory of God in heaven, and it's going to be a good thing. It's not going to hurt. It's not going to burn you to bits. <laughs> it's not going to smite you on the spot. So... Anyways, maybe just some interesting musings. Um, not a whole lot of law and gospel, I suppose, in that in that sermon. But it's it was just something that I had been thinking about. Like why, you know, these questions about the transfiguration. It was one of the one, it's one of the more confusing, I think, um, uh, biblical narratives. And I think that that can be a benefit when there's a confusing story that we can you know look at it a little bit closer and see what else we can get out of it. Anyways, thank you so much. God bless and take care.